Hello everyone in CardioMice channel and welcome back after a long gap for about six months and we are resuming the videos explaining the guidelines and today we are starting with the 2023 EEC guidelines for the management of infective endocarditis and the first video to be explained today is the topic of the prevention of infective endocarditis. First of all, let's set some facts. The important portals of entry of any bacteria or fungi to infect the heart include infection of the skin or cavity, gastrointestinal tract or genitourinary system, direct inoculation in people who inject drugs or any unprotected vascular puncture, for example, central line or mahooker, healthcare exposure by invasive diagnostic or therapeutic procedure like transcatheter or surgical techniques. Of course, the oral cavity is one of the important entry points for infective endocarditis as it is colonized by relevant commensal flora, like for example, oral group streptococci. And so, any oral surgery or dental procedures that involve manipulation of the gingival or periapical region of the teeth are considered at high risk to cause bacteremia and so may increase the risk for infective endocarditis in predisposed individuals. The notion of successful antibiotic prophylaxis assumes that reducing the bacteremia that is associated with the medical procedure will reduce the risk of infective endocarditis and that's why it is used. However, systematic use of antibiotic prophylaxis has been questioned due to the lack of randomized clinical trials that demonstrated their efficacy prior to medical procedures because they need very large number of individuals and prolonged follow-up duration. The costs of these trials are very high and unacceptable, and the standard of care today for any high-risk individual is to receive antibiotic prophylaxis before any invasive oral dental procedures. That's why there is some question mark regarding antibiotic prophylaxis, especially for non-oral or non-dental procedures. There are some population-based studies that evaluated the efficacy of antibiotic prophylaxis using bacteremia as a surrogate of infective endocarditis. However, so far the relationship between bacteremia and infective endocarditis is not straightforward because sometimes bacteremia may be caused by some daily activities throughout the day like tooth brushing, flossing or chewing. And so they may occur repetitively and it's not always correlated with infective endocarditis and recently it has been shown that antibiotic prophylaxis in high-risk individuals was associated with significant reduction of infective endocarditis after invasive dental procedures. This is the strongest evidence so far for the antibiotic prophylaxis. So we are going to divide our patients to those at high risk or intermediate risk for infective endocarditis, otherwise they are considered at low risk for infective endocarditis. Let's start with the high-risk group. Those are at high risk for infective endocarditis and so antibiotic prophylaxis here is recommended or should be considered before oral or dental procedures. For example, patients with previous infective endocarditis or those with recurrent infective endocarditis who are more frequently to have prostatic valves or prostatic material, staphylococcal infective endocarditis or people who inject drugs. Also patients with surgically or transcatheter implanted prosthetic valves or those with any prosthetic material used for cardiac valve repair are at high risk. And needless to say that prosthetic valve endocarditis has twice as high in hostile mortality rate as the native valve infective endocarditis with higher risk of complication like heart failure or conduction disturbance regardless of the pathogen. What about by prosthetic valves? Bioprosthetic valve also may be associated with increased risk of infective endocarditis as compared with mechanical prosthesis. So please don't neglect the risk of infective endocarditis in those patients. Regarding the transcatheter implanted valves, the highest risk for morbidity and mortality are in those patients with aortic or pulmonary prosthetic valve. However, the data on the risk of infective endocarditis for transcatheter mitral and tricuspid valves are still limited. And regarding the prosthetic material used for cardiac repairs, they include surgical aneuroplasty or mitral valve percutaneous edge-to-edge -edge repair, so those patients are also at high risk. 
And don't forget that in the first six months after implantation of septal defect closure device or left atrial appendage closure device, vascular grafts, IVC filters, or central venous system ventricular atrial chance, this duration the patient is at high risk for infective endocarditis. Patients with congenital heart disease, excluding isolated congenital abnormalities like congenital aortic or pulmonary stenosis, are at high risk for infective endocarditis as the overall incidence rate for adults is 27 to 44 times those who have structurally normal heart and in children the incidence is 0.41 per 1000 persons per year and the risk is increased in untreated cyanotic congenital heart disease and those whose surgery includes prosthetic material like valve conduit or systemic to pulmonary shunts. And as we mentioned that the risk of post-operative infective endocarditis for those who have transcatheter ASD or VSD closure with device or surgical closure with non-valve related prosthetic material have high risk in the first six months after the procedure. And the last group not to be forgotten are the patients with LVSL device who are considered at high risk because of associated morbidity and mortality. What about the intermediate risk group? They include those with rheumatic heart disease, non-rheumatic degenerative valve disease like mitral valve prolapse or flayed leaflets, congenital valve abnormalities like bicuspid aortic valve, and those with cardiovascular implanted electronic device like all the types of pacemaker, CRT, and ICDs. Also patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and those with heart transplant. Those patients have a higher risk of infective endocarditis compared with the background population, but so far further studies are required. And here antibiotic prophylaxis is not routinely recommended, but it is not class 3, and so it may be considered on an individual basis according to the local protocol for each hospital. However, prevention measures are strongly recommended in those patients. Let's give some examples for the general prevention measures that should be followed in patients at high or intermediate risk of infective endocarditis. They should be encouraged to maintain twice daily tooth brushing and use dental flossing daily, to seek professional dental cleaning and follow up at least twice per year for high risk patients and once per year for the intermediate risk patients, strict hygiene for the skin including optimized treatment for any chronic skin condition and disinfection of wounds and curative antibiotics for any focus of bacterial infection. But advise the patient to avoid self-medication with antibiotics to avoid any microbial resistance, strict infection control for any at-risk procedure in a hostel or in a clinic, discourage any type of piercing or tattooing because they are unnecessary procedures that increase the risk of infective endocarditis and limit the use of infusion catheters and invasive procedure whenever possible and of course strict adherence to care bundles for central and peripheral cannula especially for the central venous catheters or the hookers because they increase the risk of infective endocarditis. So the recommendations for antibiotic prophylaxis in cardiovascular patients undergoing orodental procedures at increased risk for infective endocarditis. There is class 1 for the general prevention measures that we mentioned for those at high or intermediate risk. Antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended in any patient with previous infective endocarditis or those with surgically implanted prosthetic valve or any material used for valve repair and patient with transcatheter implanted aortic and pulmonary valvular prosthesis. Pay attention that we are speaking here about antibiotic prophylaxis before orodental procedures, not any type of procedure. Also, it is indicated in patients with untreated cyanotic congenital heart disease or those treated with surgery or transcatheter procedures with post-operative palliative shunts, conduit, or other prosthesis. And after surgical repair, in the absence of residual defects or valve prosthesis, the antibiotic is recommended for the first six months after the procedure and of course in patients with LV SS device all of these are class 1 recommendations before orodental procedures. The recommendation is class 2A 
for those with transcatheter mitral and tricuspid valve repair and class 2b in the recipients of heart transplant and the big no that antibiotic prophylaxis is not recommended in patients at low risk for infective endocarditis pay attention he didn't mention here patients who are at intermediate risk because the decision in this case is individualized but in low risk patient no indication at all as we mentioned that antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended in those at high risk of infective endocarditis undergoing at risk dental procedures like what like dental extractions periodontal surgery oral biopsies or dental procedures involving manipulation of the gingival or periapical region like for example scaling or root canal procedure and also dental implant surgery so far there is no contraindication for teeth implants in patients at high risk for infective endocarditis and the indication should be discussed on an individual basis and of course with antibiotic prophylaxis what about the non-dental procedures so far there is no convincing evidence regarding the relationship between bacteremia resulting from non-dental procedure and the risk of subsequent infective endocarditis however some observational studies reported that compared with patients with infective endocarditis who have not undergone an invasive procedure multiple invasive non-dental procedures were associated with increased risk for infective endocarditis for example cardiovascular intervention skin procedures and wound management blood transfusion or dialysis bone marrow puncture and endoscopic procedures so we cannot ignore the risk of infective endocarditis after these non-dental procedures so there is a class one recommendation for antibiotic prophylaxis in high risk patients who are having high risk dental procedures that we mentioned shortly and the antibiotics should target oral streptococci which is the most common pathogen to be translocated to the heart causing infective endocarditis but there is a new recommendation that i think many of you have heard about that there is a class 2b for antibiotic prophylaxis for high risk patient and i'm meaning it not intermediate risk patient undergoing invasive diagnostic or therapeutic procedure for the respiratory system like bronchoscopy gastrointestinal like the upper or lower gi endoscopy genitourinary tract skin or musculoskeletal system this is a new recommendation in order to provide evidence that those patients who are at high risk for infective endocarditis may benefit from antibiotic prophylaxis before non-dental procedures and this is a quote from the full text of the guidelines that this task force no longer felt that there is a class 3 recommendation for antibiotic prophylaxis in high risk patient undergoing non-dental procedure so you can give them on individual basis this table shows the options for the antibiotics to be chosen for prophylaxis of course if the patient is having no allergy to penicillin so we can choose ampicillin amoxicillin or ceftriaxone and giving one dose 30 minutes if it is a parental dose before the procedure or 60 minutes if it is an oral dose before the procedure but if the patient is having allergy to penicillin and pay attention that cephalosporins should not be used in any patient with a history of allergic reaction to penicillin like anaphylaxis angioedema or articular rash you should avoid all beta lactams and there are other options to be chosen for antibiotic prophylaxis there are some specific recommendation for the prevention of infective endocarditis in cardiovascular procedures themselves for example preoperative screening for nasal carriage of staph aureus is a class one before any elective cardiac surgery or transcatheter valve implantation and also before implanting a pacemaker preoperative antibiotic prophylaxis is important before placing cardiac implantable electric device and the optimal pre-procedure aseptic measures at the site of implantation is important to prevent pocket infections that can result in cardiac device related infection which has a detrimental prognosis periprocedural antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended in patients undergoing surgical or transcatheter implantation of a prostatic valve for example TAVI or any intravascular 
prosthetic or other foreign material and the most frequent microorganism here that may result in early surgical prosthetic valve endocarditis that includes the one year after the surgery are the coagulase negative staphylococci or staph aureus and of course surgical standard aseptic measures are recommended during the insertion and manipulation of catheters in high risk patient for example a patient with prosthetic valve undergoing coronary angiography or electrophysiological study you should adhere to the standard aseptic measures to protect the patient against the risk of infective endocarditis if it was discovered that the patient has a potential source of sepsis including dental or oral origin or for example the patient was having the nasal swab showing staph aureus it should be considered to have at least two weeks of antibiotic therapy before implanting a prosthetic valve or any other intracardiac or intravascular foreign material including cardiac pacemakers of course in urgent procedure we are going for the procedure but in elective procedure wait at least two weeks and the antibiotics should cover the common skin flora like for example enterococci and staph aureus or according to the results of swab especially before TAVI and other transcatheter valvular procedures and the big no that systematic skin or nasal decolonization without screening for staph aureus is not recommended we are of course recommending antibiotic prophylaxis before these procedures but according to the results of the swabs either from the skin the nasal or the oral cavity to avoid microbial resistance so we have reached the end of our video today and our take-home message that the antibiotic prophylaxis is still the cornerstone practice for high-risk patients who undergo orodental procedures but it is not a class 3 recommendation and it still it depends on the local practice and infection control policy of the hostel so for example for intermediate risk patient having orodental procedures or for high risk patient having non-dental procedures that we mentioned a class 2b recommendation we can give sometimes antibiotic prophylaxis according to the individual case of the patient so it is not a class 3 except in low risk individuals so sometimes you may consider it according to your local protocol thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week as we are going to speak about the diagnosis of infective endocarditis